Uh, so welcome everyone. We're excited to have you here to the first of many, hopefully, Indeed Flex uh, community events that we're doing for our clients um, and really employers in general uh, to help everyone understand uh, the labor market, the recruitment industry, so that we can help to better serve our clients and really share some of the data and information that we have. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming and also for journeying up to the fifth floor. I was very specific. I said, like, there can't be a stage. It needs to be small. This is my first time in front of people in like 18 months, <laughs> so I can't embarrass myself. Um, but to give you some background, this is so the Indeed Flex community event, most of you, if not all, this is probably your first time coming to an event like this, uh, sponsored by Indeed Flex. And really, what it is to give everyone a little bit of, a, of, of concept and understanding, we're really trying to do three things here. Our employer community, which is, which is you, uh, really is supposed to be made up of, of three components. And we, our goal here is really to be able to deliver value to your, to your teams uh, to help you become better and more efficient and more effective uh, recruitment HR teams. So there's really three main components that we want to be able to help provide value uh, for your teams. One of them is insights, Indeed Insights. As Indeed Flex is part of Indeed, we have a huge, huge amount of data on the market, the industry, what are the trends that are happening, what are other clients and employers doing. And so a big part of what we want to do throughout this series that we're starting now is to be able to show uh, what is happening in the market and what are the important things that you should probably see the data, understand it, so that you can be hopefully a first mover within your market. Because ultimately, what you are doing as recruiters, HR, um, and operations is you are competing largely, especially right now, with other businesses for talent. Right? And so it's very important to make sure that your team uh, knows how to act and how to be very nimble. The other part of it is Indeed Flex Insights. Indeed Flex has over 50,000 vetted job seekers. Uh, we have workers going out and working across the UK and in the US now on a daily basis. And so we try to provide a lot of insights to our clients by saying, here's what our clients are doing. Here's some of the best practices of the people that we work with. Maybe there are some ideas that you might be able to take and leverage for your own organization. And then finally, uh, your business insights. So really understanding, and we want to be able to take kind of the Indeed focus uh, and the Indeed Flex data that we have and then be able to, to, to distill it down and say, how can you take some of this information to be able to go out next week and be able to act on it, hopefully, to be able to make a real and measurable change within your organization. So what we're going to go through today is a little bit of the dynamics of, of the market. Uh, we're going to have, we have two guests. Uh, Kieran talking about uh, the, she's a part of, uh, is a specialist in Lean Six Sigma. She's going to be talking about talent attraction. I'm sure a lot of you are thinking Lean Six Sigma and talent attraction, but, but there's some really interesting tie-ins. We've done an HR survey with over 400 HR professionals and HR directors within the UK, and we're going to share our results with that. We've also got Emma, who's going to be uh, joining us and, and talking a little bit about employer branding, and then we'll be able to uh, refill our drinks. So I promise you, those first four bullet points, we won't take too long so we can get to the most important, which is the fifth one. So I start with this slide, and I know it's a little bit depressing, and it's definitely nothing new. It's really hard to hire. You can go and search Job Market UK or really Global Job Market just about anywhere, and everyone is going through the same thing. Um, it's very hard to find talent. It's very hard to find good talent. It's very hard to retain and keep good talent right now. And so with that, what we've realized and what we've noticed is that we have two choices. We can, really three choices, fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze is just do the same thing we've always been doing and hope that things get better. Flight is just give up, right? Close up shop and just leave. And I don't think anyone wants to do either of those things. And so the last one is fight, and really fighting through it and trying to figure out what are some inventive ways that we can differentiate ourselves. And so what we've found through a lot of the research and what we're going to be talking about with our guests, uh, Kieran and, and, and Emma, as well as the HR survey, is that companies have to think outside the box right now. With COVID, with the pandemic and furlough, and with Brexit, the labor market has changed quite significantly in the UK. And it's meaning that we have, to, we have to do things a little bit differently. I'll get to it in a little bit, uh, but the, the gut reaction for a lot of clients is, well, we just need to pay people more. 
And that's an option, but money doesn't grow on trees. And we have to be able to think of other ways to be able to drive the best talent to working at your organizations. And we have a little bit of a, a unique perspective of this because Indeed Flex and Indeed, we're a two-sided marketplace. We have job seekers and we have clients. If we only had one of them, we would not be in business, right? And so we have to understand truly what are job seekers doing? What do they want? What are they desiring? What changes are they making in the way their behavior, in their behaviors, especially over the past 18 months? And then we try to help our clients understand that so that they can make the according changes to be able to, to have better success. So it's, 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 a, it's an interesting and also very challenging market. Uh, I don't recommend anyone getting into a two-sided marketplace because it's hard to match those two things. But we've, we've done it and uh, we want to be able to help you understand what's happening in the labor market. Uh, and, and so this is some Indeed data that's really interesting. Believe it or not, believe it or not, jobs and job postings on Indeed are up 28% over pre-pandemic levels. So there are more jobs than there were before the pandemic. It's pretty interesting to think about, right? On the other hand, the people that are looking for jobs, right, two-sided marketplace, you've got the jobs, but then let's look at the people that are looking for jobs. This really hasn't gone up 28%. It's about stagnant. So we have 28% more jobs than we did, and we have the same workers. So what that means is that ultimately we're competing for, there's more demand and there's the same supply. So we're competing for the same workers. So very important to figure out what are ways that we can be able to drive those workers to your businesses over all of the other litany of companies that are trying to also attract workers. And additionally, this is, this, 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 this is some real specific data here. If you see in bartending, and this is I think uh, a, a survey we did of bartenders in London on Indeed, there are 8,336 less bartenders in the market looking for jobs in London than there were 18, 20 months ago. And so because of that, Salaries have gone up 12%. And that's one way that people are dealing with that. Uh, on warehousing, it's, even, it's an even starker difference. There are 438 more jobs posted on Indeed now than there were pre-pandemic. By the way, I can post one job and be hiring 100 people for that job. Right? So this is just true job postings. And there are 34,000, 35,000 less job seekers that are out there. And, as everyone, and, and the top employer by far is Amazon, and Amazon is offering very, very aggressive promotions for people to go and join their organization, which, which is great for them. Um, but these are, this is kind of the state of affairs. This is where we are right now. And so really what we want to talk about today is how we can improve that. There's a lot of economic uncertainty. Um, there is an uneven recovery. No one knew that there would be significantly more, 438 more warehouse jobs than we had pre-pandemic. So there's been a shuffling of the deck, if you will, with jobs, but also with workers. People have left the UK, people have retired. New workers, millennials, have graduated from uni and they want something different than what, they used, what, what the traditional job seeker used to want. And so that's what we really want to be able to help educate your teams on over the course of the, the next 30 or 45 minutes. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Karen. Uh, she is a, the uh, founder and owner of Continuous Projects. So Karen, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Big round of applause, everyone. Okay, Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about Lean Six Sigma and how it can help with talent attraction. And as, um, as we said earlier, what's, how does that work? What do, what's the connection there? So firstly, a bit about me. I'm Kieran. Um, I am a self-confessed lean geek. So I am always looking at ways to deliver more for less. I'm always looking at how to make things more efficient, even at home where I'm trying to make my house work more efficient. Haven't quite won that yet. Um, and in case you're interested, I'm a Sagittarius with two kids. Um, and I run a, a small boutique consultancy called Continuous Improvement Projects, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. So we work with organisations across all industries, helping them drive improved customer experience, drive efficiency, um, and ultimately be more sustainable and deliver change. Um, so we've been operating since 2012, and we're a small team of about 15, 16 people. Now, 
I came across uh, a really interesting um, stat with some research that was recently done by Glassdoor, which suggested that 77% of adults consider company culture before applying for a job. Now, interestingly, even in recent job interviews, I find that employees are asking things like, what's your company culture like? In today's world where we've got access to abundant amount of information online, we can see people put, posting on LinkedIn, we can see people posting on other social media sites, we've got reviews about companies um, online through places like Glassdoor. So people have access to information that says, is it a good place to work? And it's people have become quite, they're, they're thinking about what's really important to them. They, they're really rethinking. I think COVID has made people rethink their careers, what really they want to be spending their time doing, what gives them purpose. So I think this point around culture is really key. So how do we attack that big, hairy thing, that thing that no one can really describe, culture? It's often big, ugly, scary. And if it's not tackled, it can have significant impacts because we all know, you know, as we network with people, as we talk with people, um, people will talk about where they work and they tell you what's great about it or what they hate about it. They post things online and actually people see that, people hear that, and it does affect what they think about your company. So I'm here to talk to you today about how you can do that, how you can help start looking at how you can create the future you want to invent. Um, so as uh, Apple founder, Steve Jobs, thank you. Um, Steve Jobs once said, uh, the best way to create the future is to invent it. So how do we start to tackle culture and how can we use culture as a way to um, almost attract new talent? And we'll talk about um, how Lean Six Sigma can start to help that. So what is Lean Six Sigma, firstly? Because it's one of those terms, no one really knows what it means, and there's lots of definitions online about what it is. In very simple terms, um, Lean is about creating more value for your customers with fewer resources. And when I talk about resources, I'm not talking about becoming a really skinny organisation with less people. That, that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. It's about how do you deliver more through eliminating waste? So how can you improve and, and deliver more value for your customers, but eliminate all the waste. So all the rework in your processes, all the papers that you're having to, you know, all the documentation you have to having to deal with, um, all the inventory that starts piling up in your processes, how can you start to eliminate that? Six Sigma, on the other hand, um, it com complements Lean, and in very simple terms, it's a set of data-driven tools and techniques to help drive process improvement. And I'm going to talk a bit about how process improvement can really actually help um, with the recruitment process as well, and we'll come on to that shortly. I'm a very visual person, so I like to see pictures. So lean visualised, we might all be familiar with processes that look a bit like that. Lots of going back and forth, emailing and so on. And actually a process after lean is simplified. And the aim of Lean is to continuously improve and simplify your processes. And what, what tends to happen is when you've got a process that looks a bit like that, you're relying on a lot of local knowledge, you're relying on a lot of specialist skills, and actually when you're then trying to look at your recruitment and you're trying to find, you know, you're, you're trying to um, recruit people, you're, you're conscious of the complexities around your process and you're trying to find the right fit for that. And actually, by simplifying your processes, you might find that you have other ways to... You, you might need different skills. If you simplify your processes, you might start to look at what, really skill, what skills you really need for the job. Six Sigma Visualise, it's all about quality and getting your processes right. So is there lots of variation in your processes? Because again, that can be quite difficult to recruit for. How do, you, how do you recruit someone and, and then try and get them to understand the complexities of all the different ways of working? Um, or are you just off target? Are you not meeting what the customer wants? So the goal of Six Sigma is to meet your customer's requirements, add more value. A really good example of where Lean is in action and where we see examples of really strong 
talent re uh, retention and talent attraction is Toyota. Um, so Toyota is the epitome of lean. Uh, they, they, are co they coined the term the Toyota way, the lean Toyota way. And they have used lean in their business to drive a continuous improvement culture and really help people connect passion with purpose. So they really drive that whole creative culture where people feel empowered to go in and make improvements and actually it's, it's a place where people want to work because they feel like they can make a difference they're not there doing transactional manufacturing as you may think when you think of a manufacturing process it's really creative quote there is actually from an industrial engineer um, and founder of the toyota way at lean and he says the toyota style is not to create results by working hard it is a system that says there is no limit to people's creativity. People don't go to Toyota to work, they go to think. And they're known for that in that industry. And I think companies need to work really hard now to attract new talent because actually, just because you might have a big brand name doesn't mean everybody wants to come and work there. So I think companies need to work really hard at how are they going to attract new talent. And I think how you build that culture and how that then gets exposed and um, visible to the outside world is really important. So what can you do? What can you do today? When you, when you walk out of this room, what are some of the things, some of the principles of lean that you can take away and start to apply in your businesses to really help? Um, so the first one is start with a clear vision. Where, where do you see the company in the future? Because actually thinking Thinking forward rather than thinking about the current reactive state of we've got shortages of uh, resource. If you start to think about what the future looks like, you can start to understand where, where there might be a shift in what you're actually looking for. So how many people and what roles will they play? What does that look like? How many clients will the business have? What does the working environment look like? What does it feel like? What products and services will you be selling? What business relationships will exist? And what else do you see? And if you start with that clear vision, you can start to understand your long-term strategy, not just your short-term immediate need to recruit people. And then start to think about what's stopping you. What's stopping you from achieving that vision? So ask yourself that question. Draw out your vision. It might be, you know, you might create a mood board, a vision board. Uh, you might draw a picture. And what's stopping you from achieving that? So really define some of those problems that are currently stopping you from achieving that. And that, that includes what does that workforce look like and what's stopping you from getting there. Um, start to get deeper into the root causes of that. And then there's a really great tool uh, in the Lean Toolkit, which allows you to be like a really annoying kid uh, where you get to just ask the question why constantly and you, you can be like, why, why? But ask yourself why, just keep asking yourself why until you really get down to the bottom of what are some of the current problems that you're facing, um, you know, and they might explain why you might have challenges with your resource uh, attraction at the moment, how, how you attract talent. Because actually you might find that you're not trying to attract the right talent. Maybe, maybe the skills that you need are slightly different to what you might have thought of first. And then into the exciting bit that gives us all the uh, endorphins and makes us feel good, starting to think about the solutions. So in the lean world, you start with blue sky thinking. What does the ideal state look like? And then you work backwards. I talked about streamlining processes earlier, and I, I, I mentioned that I'll talk about how processes has a big connection with um, the talent attraction aspect. So if you can make it easier to do the right thing, if you can streamline your processes, make them more simple, as I said earlier, you'll find that those specialist skills you might be trying to find might not be needed. And actually, you might need a different type of skill set. So is there a way to change the role by doing things in a more simpler way and an easier way to open the doors to a different type of talent into your business. Perhaps you're so fixed on, I need to recruit this type of person and actually you might be able to widen that and think about what else, what other sorts of talents uh, you could bring into the business. 
So that, that uh, entails a lot of process redesign, opening opportunities to different skills and talents. Um, deliver more for less. I find it really interesting, that stat about uh, how vacancies have gone up, jobs have gone up. Because actually, you know, when you think about the pandemic, we've all gone into remote working. Um, we've had to find other ways of doing things. And I, I find it fascinating that actually some of that now has resulted in more jobs. So it's about thinking again, back to the why and the what. Prioritise, implement and then drive continuous improvement. People are your greatest assets. And, and that's really what we're talking about today, aren't we? We're talking about people because your business is nothing without people. So be the new breed of employer that everybody wants to go and work for. And that actually means really walking the talk. So not just saying that you, know, you're, you care about your people, but how do you walk the talk? Because I tell you, people know. People know if you're walking the talk or whether you're just sort of putting things out that doesn't, there's no substance behind. So foster a learning culture, show people, you know, really grow your people. And that, that will help with retention as well. Develop your team's problem solving skills, because actually they should help you drive improvements. Coming back to the Toyota way I, I talked about earlier, they're not there to just come in and do a job. They're there to help solve problems. They're there to drive continuous improvement. Get your teams involved in that. You'll, you'll be surprised at how much um, they can drive in your company. Give them the tools they need and empower them. Give them empowerment because actually by connecting purpose with passion, you get so much more out of your team and that, that shines when they talk to other people about your company. Um, we do do a, we do train on sort of Lean Six Sigma and um, problem solving, uh, empowering people in how they can drive continuous improvement as part of their day job. So if anyone's interested, please come and speak to me. And I talked earlier about the fact that online, we've got access to so much data, so much information that tells us it, it's a shop window into your company. It really is. I, I can go on anywhere and find uh, things about companies. And actually, you know, even people that speak to me about my company, it's like they know everything about me and I've not even told them anything. Uh, you know, it's, they, they've got a shop window. They know everything. I don't know how. Um, so think about your brand fusion touch points. And I think you're probably going to touch a bit more on that, Emma. Um, so... Think about what touch points do, your, do, to the, do the outside world have into your business and how can you start to pull the levers to try and um, influence people's decision making. And there are three key things I think I've put there really from a HR perspective that I think fundamentally will make or break what people's perception is of your company. And, and they are recruitment. So if you have an awful recruitment process, the person's likely not to want to even join the company. Um, onboarding process. I've, I've, I've had people go through an awful onboarding process and actually they're just set up to fail because actually they've not been supported. And training and development, really, really important. Grow your people. And, and very much what I've talked about there is around the Lean Six Sigma principles. I will share all of this. Are the slides going to be shared at the end? Yeah, brilliant. So um, you've got access to some information there and free resources. Thank you. And uh, does anyone have any questions? I'll uh, pass over then. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, so I thought, I thought like one thing that was really interesting to me that really stood out, I, I liked, especially at the end, it kind of brought it home, was there's recruitment, onboarding, training, and then continuous development. And those areas are so important and so crucial. And a lot of the times you say, well, we just need to recruit more people, hire more recruiters, right? And that's, that's a component of it, but at the same time, if you've got people there that you're starting, that training and onboarding process determines how quickly and how long they stay with your organization. When I rewind, the, 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 what you said really, really re reminded me of a stat that I saw when I was, when I was just getting into my career, and, uh, and they had said that, if you have a mentor when you start at your job, you are, and I don't remember the stat, I think 75% of stats are made up, but I, so I don't remember the number, but it was, you are hugely more likely to be successful if you just have a mentor, right? So even if you're a restaurant and you're bringing on a server, hey, 
Would you mind helping this person out today, right? Small things like that are important. And then another thing we're going to talk about in a minute, which, which I thought was great, was the fact that training and development is so important because especially millennials right now, that is literally the most important part of a job for them. More important than pay is development and training. And these are things that are, quite honestly, free for us to develop. And those are the things we need to start thinking about as we're continuing to evolve the way that we recruit. So what we're going to talk about today is actually the feedback from everyone here in this room. So we did a survey of hundreds and hundreds of over 400 HR directors across the UK and asked them, tell us about the labor market and tell us what you're doing to be able to make changes and make improvements. Uh, specifically, we asked them, what are the challenges? What are you doing to attract talent in this challenging time? And then what are your longer term plans throughout 2022 to be able to really differentiate and, and, and try to turn it around, if you will, because as everyone knows, since probably July, it's been very, very difficult to, to be able to, to bring on new workers. So this is the, the last doom and gloom slide, I hope, of this presentation. As everyone knows, it's really hard and the HRDs that we surveyed agreed. 81% said that it's really difficult to hire people right now. Um, but they also said they're having to change the way that they're hiring. So because it's hard to hire, that means that each recruiter, instead of pre-pandemic being able to hire 11 people a month, it's so much harder. Now they can only hire four or five people a month because they're having to put so much time and effort into recruiting. And so they're having to find other ways, such as temporary staffing, to be able to bridge that gap. And additionally, they were finding that because it's been so difficult, to hire people, because it's been so difficult to bring people on, a lot of the times you're potentially having to run an understaffed location, or you're potentially in the position where you're bringing on people that maybe don't have the skill set that you might ideally like. And so there are, at the site level, there are becoming a lot of inefficiencies. So worker quality is an issue. Um, the amount of time it takes to fill a, a vacancy has increased. And overall, clients aren't able, to, they're feeling like, I'm sending a lot of people to work, but I don't really actually know what's happening with them. I don't know how are they performing, what are they doing. The site manager is too busy right now to be able to give me that feedback because of the increased demand a lot of the times. Um, and because, uh, frankly, they don't have maybe the quality workers they might like. So they're spending time on training. So I'm not able to get that, that feedback loop, back loop has started to, to, to break. And so then we asked companies and clients, HRDs, and we said, well, what are the things that you're doing to improve. And the good news is that almost no one is doing nothing. Everyone is doing something for the most part. Um, they're increasing their benefits. They're trying to drive engagement. They're offering flexibility, focusing on brand. You can see only 15% are really focusing on increasing wages right now. And so there are, the point of this slide is that there are a lot of tools in the tool belt for, that we can use, that we can try to think outside the box. Um, as, as, as Kira had mentioned, right, it's not about just paying people more. It's about training them, developing them, having a strong onboarding process. And so I'd challenge you and, and encourage you, if, if that's part of your role in the organization, like let's look and let's do a refresh. Is there opportunities to, to maybe dust it off a little bit over the last 18 months? Uh, is there something that we can do to improve that? Or can you influence the people within your organization that actually are responsible for the onboarding uh, and, and the retention of, of workers? Because if they can retain more people, it makes everyone's job a lot easier. But as we all know, right, people have increased wages. And if you look at it, on average, over s about 60% of organizations that have increased wages have done it by more than 5%. So this is like, you don't often see companies just coming out and especially such a huge percentage of companies going and increasing wages by such a significant amount in a very short period of time. And so you can see this is an acute problem. But my view on this, I, I kind of feel like it's a, little bit, it's a little bit of an easy way out. Let's just pay people more. Let's put a Band-Aid over it. Bad recruitment process, ah, bad onboarding, no training, no big deal. You don't give, you know, you're not bringing in the lunch every once in a while. You don't have those little fringe benefits, whatever, just pay them a pound more. And ultimately, and we'll talk about it in a second, but it's not just about pay anymore. Employees want more than that now. And so we need to think outside the box. And, and, and really, we all, we don't have unlimited funds to spend. Right? We're not 
Fortune 100 companies that have the ability to go and spend thousands and thousands and thousands of, of extra pounds or dollars to be able to go and recruit these people, these workers. And so we need to think about other ways to do it. And so when we talked to some of these uh, uh, HRDs and said, well, what are you thinking about doing over the course of next year? Really, the results were, were, were quite across the board. Um, people were thinking about streamlining their processes, increasing the visibility, um, improving their brand was a huge part, one of the leaders, adding reward and recognition components. You know, so there have been a lot of organizations that have operated very similarly, and they're saying, maybe if we, we, we don't have enough people right now, Maybe if we already know we're understaffed, what we could do is say, hey, if you do really well today, you get a 20 pound bonus. Now I've got someone who's a little bit more productive than they were before. They're getting a little bit more money. They're feeling like every time you win, right, you press the button and you get a treat, people love that. Those types of things, those types of small, low cost ideas can have an opportunity to really have large impacts in your organization. And not just on retention, but also on recruitment. Because you can then go advertise a lot of these perks that, uh, that, that, that some of these businesses are doing. But ultimately, when I looked at the data with our marketing team, what I noticed that there was, there is a huge gap. 60, and here's just one of the many examples. 66% of HRDs think that the value proposition of the organization is a reason that someone would join. Over half Two-thirds think that value proposition, employee br employer brand, is a reason that someone would join your company, like Kira just mentioned. And 28% and are, are, are planning on doing it in the future. And less than 13% are actually doing it right now. So my message is, like, let's get on the horse and let's, let's get going. Because ultimately, we all know what needs to be done. We need to improve our value proposition. We need to improve our brand. We need to improve how we stand on the marketplace. Very easy and quick wins. Um, but ultimately, HR directors aren't doing it. And we tell you that because this is, this is a secret for you, right? Not everyone knows this. And so you can have the opportunity to be a first mover. If you have woken up one day and said, you know what? I think brand is important. The brand of our organization is important when we're hiring people. You're, 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 you're in the majority, but most of the other people aren't acting on it. And that's where your opportunity comes, is how can you act to take these low cost in different ways to think outside the box, to be able to drive employee branding, get workers excited to come to work for you. Um, and, and really to underscore that, you know, over a third of, of, of our clients and, and these HRDs say that they don't really quite understand um, their the workers and what the workers want. And the workers are saying the same thing. About a third of workers are saying, our clients don't really know what we value and what is important to us. So the question is, what is important to workers? So workers' priorities have changed. The, the uh, Gen X, if you paid them a thousand pounds more a year, they were going to change jobs. That's how it was. Things have changed now, though. Um, first of all, a third of the workforce is part-time now. And that's slated to increase. So people don't necessarily want to work that 9 to 5 job. They have had the luxury, uh, in some cases, of being able to work from home a lot or being on furlough. And so they've liked this new freedom and difference into their schedules. And so that idea of being a sous chef and, and, and working from 3 to 2, 3 PM to 2 AM, is not attractive to me anymore. And, and so they're thinking about other ways that they might be able to set up their schedule that's going to be more beneficial for them. Additionally, if you look at it, what is the most important thing? Wages is up there, but shift patterns. I want to have more flexibility in the way that I work. That's the most important thing to me, is being able to decide my schedule, or at least not have such a rigid schedule. And so I'd encourage a lot of you to think, like, do we think about what is the most convenient for our business when we're planning our shift patterns? Or do we think about what's going to work best for the workers as well? Because those types of things are important components that are going to help drive more workers to want to stay. It's not just about giving a pound more an hour. It's sometimes about these other fringe benefits. And you can see employee benefits, flexibility, flexibility and shift patterns kind of in the same bu bucket here. Um, mental health and, and, and uh, remote working, really the six most important uh, components for a lot of workers these days. 
And so ultimately, 60% of workers, so now we're merging these two surveys together, 60% of workers say flexibility is the most important thing, right, when it was flexibility and shift patterns. Grand total of 21% of clients are actually acting on that. So this is, this is the door that's open for you, right? This is the opportunity to really think about, are there ways that are low, zero cost that we can make our work uh, and our workers retain them and be more efficient. And it might be a little bit of growing pains from an operational side, but what's worse, having only 60% staffed on any given Saturday when the restaurant is full or the warehouse is, is, is humming during peak, or is it just having a convenient shift pattern for the operations directors? All right, so I would, I would challenge you really to think about that and be a challenger within your business to really decide, is this the right way that we're running our business? And then one of the last things I'll talk about, and I kind of mentioned this before about millennials, but millennials are the largest actual share of the workforce. They're, they actually make up 46% of the workforce, and they're going to be over 50% of the workforce in the next couple of years. Sorry, millennials slash Gen Z, which is, is, is a little bit of the younger group that is graduating from uni right now. Um, but what they're saying is that, additionally, if I am not valued by my employer and I'm not given development opportunities, I'm going to leave. And you know what? 65%, and this is of all the stats, this is the highest, the most important thing for millennial potential employees in make, choosing a job was what their training and development opportunities were. Everyone thinks, oh, millennials, they're just going to leave. They're going to float from job to job. No. The reason they leave is because no one's helping them get better. They want to stay and they want to get better. They want to improve, and we need to give them the ability and the platform to be able to do that. It doesn't have to be anything big, but how can you take someone from a, uh, how can you take someone from a, a, a busser to a waiter, a waiter to potentially a bartender? How can we help them make that step if that's what they want to do? And so ultimately, we're having a hard time finding the right talent, and a lot of the times, the, the talent that we want, they want to get trained, they want to get developed. So another thing, another idea, thinking outside the box, you're like, does it make sense to say, hey, maybe we hire people that might not quite have the right skill set yet. They might not have those three years of experience that we need, but we know they're hungry. We know they want it. We know they want to be trained and developed. And you take that, a strong interview process that asks the right questions of employees to understand if they have the soft skills, and you pair that with a strong training and onboarding program, all of a sudden you have the ability to start bringing in people that maybe don't have that skill set yet, but they want to develop and improve into it. So those are some other thoughts and ways. And so ultimately, the way we see it is, if you can work towards, it's, it's not just saying, hey, go out and hire a bunch of unskilled people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, can you hone in your interview process to be able to find people that are like those diamonds in the rough? Ask better questions when you're interviewing them. They might not have the skill set, but they have the hunger, the drive, the desire to, to be better and to improve. And pair that with a training program that develops these people into your future rock stars. That's really a way that you can set yourself apart, become an employer of choice. And again, it's, it's a free option. It's not about going and offering you know, two pounds more an hour than, than, than we were before. So ultimately, as we see it, and based on the surveys that we've done of our workers and our employers, we find that there are three key areas that are really important for our clients to focus on right now. Because I do not like going to our clients as a temp staffing agency and say, just raise rates, just pay people more. That's, that's I think, kind of a lazy way to do it. I think that really the way we need to look at it is, can we provide more flexibility and look at shift patterns? Can we find a way to match the shifts to the way that people want to work. I need to drop my kid off at daycare, or I gotta take Nan to the hospital, and I want that flexibility. Can we work to train and upskill our workers so that maybe we're bringing in people that aren't quite there yet, but we know they have the core fundamentals to be successful? And then finally, what can we do to, to make ourselves to, to really take these two things and then tell everyone about it, right? That's what this is. Tell everyone, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're different. 
we're, we're providing more flexibility. We're trying to train and upskill our people. And then going out on the market and differentiating yourself because everyone knows that it has to be done. 66% of HRDs know they have to do it, but only about 25% are actually doing it. So those would be our challenges for you and some ideas of ways that you might be able to help think outside the box to be able to drive some of these challenges and solve some of these challenges that you're having. So I'll, I'll, I don't know, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer any of them. Anyone? No? Was that helpful? Yes. Give some insight? Good, perfect. Okay, well, with that, I'd like to welcome Emma, uh, who is uh, communications and engagement at Moto Hospitality. We're really excited to have her come and speak. So, Emma, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is where you have regrets that you didn't get a stage. I, like, I am here. <laughs> uh, so, thank you for having me. Um, I, yeah, that's always the problem. People say, stand up. I'm like, I am. Um, so I'm going to try and make it, I'm not going to be too technical. I'm just going to talk to you about some stories and hopefully that inspires some stuff. And I think everything these guys have already spoken about backs up exactly the same thing. You have to be the blue duck. You've got to stand out from the crowd right now. Um, I've just been presenting this to our board of directors this week, why it's so important that we stand out right now. So my aim is to give you guys the ability to be the blue duck with just kind of five top tips. So I know you're across different industries and different sectors, from the care industry to warehousing and industrial to hospitality to retail. And the great thing being at Moto, which by the way is the UK's biggest service stations, most people don't have a clue until I say that out loud. We kind of have a little bit of all of it in there. Um, and it is tough, like I get it, it's really tough. So I hope I can bring some examples in that will be relevant to you. So I think what all of us have in common is that we're all after that talent. We want you, we're all in that stage. How can we stand out from the crowd? How can we attract the right people to us? And I added an extra word in there because it is about the right people. There's no point in us going out there, putting this charge in and getting out there, and in a year's time we have the same problem again because we've attracted people that don't fit to our culture and what we want to achieve. So let's start with who am I? This is my little guy, Arthur. So I'm mum to Arthur. I'm a proud country bumpkin, I live in Dorset. Uh, so this is the big smoke for me today. <laughs> um, I ran my own marketing agency a few years back. Um, and so I've been in those shoes. I've been in the business owner shoes and I've been that person that hired more me's, which was the worst thing I could have done. I needed to hire the people that I needed for those roles. I then worked for Merlin Entertainments for five years, who many of you will probably know run things like the London Eye, Alton Towers. So I'm gonna use quite a lot of examples there because I helped to launch the employer brand there with our global head of recruitment. So we had some really interesting stuff there in terms of how we put that across to people. And I'm also a roller coaster theme park junkie, so it suited me well, and I missed the free tickets, I'm not gonna lie. So now I work for Moto Hospitality, I've been there a year. So like I said, we're the, the UK's biggest provider of motorway services, and if you guys stop at any services, I guess around here you might have gone to Heston, for example, is probably, or Cherwell Valley, there's a few dotted around. You go in there and you're served by Costa, you're actually not being served by a Costa colleague, you're being served by a motor colleague. And most people don't know that. So we've got 5,000 frontline staff that are in very unique positions that I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, in terms of how to attract those people. And I'm really passionate about employee journey and employee experience, which again, you're gonna hear hopefully today. Um, and bringing energy to that, I hope, today in terms of uh, my stories. So part of the reason I've, I've gone too quickly there, I'm still getting used to a clicker. It's been two years since I've stood up and done this. Um, one of the reasons I actually put up the picture of Arthur and I is I wouldn't be in this job, I don't think, two years ago. Moto are based in Bedfordshire. I live in Wimborne in Dorset. Since COVID, they've actually opened their eyes to different ways of doing recruitment. They're not precious about you living near the head office. They've let me work four days a week on flexible time in a fairly senior position. I don't think I'd have been doing this job two years ago. So I think it's really relevant. So num number one, know your audience. Now this is going back to my marketing skill set from a few years ago. The first thing you always taught, I'm looking at the marketing manager now, is know your audience, understand who you're talking to. And I think in the HR world, we sometimes forget that. So the first thing I would say is talk to your people. So I was at our KFC at Cherwell Valley a few weeks ago. 
And the manager there said, I am desperately trying to recruit KFC staff. And I'm just, I'm throwing it out there. I'm doing all these adverts and nothing's happening. And I just asked him a simple question. Like, tell me about two of your best staff right now. Who are they? Okay, so let's get more of them. So one of them was um, somebody that was at the local university. Okay, talk to the university. Can you put a job board up there? And the other one was a single parent and they loved the shift patterns. So I said, well, look, let's focus on them. Let's go back to those brand touch points that Kieran talked about. Where are they going? What are they seeing? When you start to break that down, you start looking at the local parent communities. You start looking at the jobs boards on the university, most of whom cost you nothing, but it's targeting those specific audiences. So you can identify those touch points and build personas. So with Moto, we've been building our persona group right now. Students are definitely one of those. Parents are definitely one. But we also have people that want a career in this sector but are just starting out. That's another group. How do we talk to them? What appeals to them? And then we have those individuals that like having that steady job. They don't really have ambitions to grow, but they really like the fact that they've got a steady job with steady shift patterns that gives them a solid income and good benefits. So when I'm looking for those people, those are the, people, those are the benefits and the strengths I'm going to talk about. So you can personalize those recruitment campaigns, personalize those communications around the type of people you're after and what appeals specifically to them. So to us, the employer value proposition is no longer one thing. It's adapting that story to the pieces that benefit that audience that you're talking to. And you can build strong communities as well. So we've spent quite a lot of time building that parent community around some of our sites to understand where those people are and how we can attract them to come and work for us. So take a motorway services site. There's no public transport. So actually parents are great. We know they've nearly always got a car and transport. We know they want flexible hours. It's a perfect fit. We've also been building those communities with our local colleges and local universities because we know not only are they great for working with us now while they're studying, they're potential graduates that can build their career with us. And like I said, there's that story of KFC. When you actually dig into it and you find out who your great workers are, not only can they refer, but it becomes much easier to find people just like them to help fill those other positions. So number two, overcome those challenges. Identify what those barriers are that people aren't coming to you. What, what's that barrier? So location can be one. I'm going to give you two examples. So Alton Towers, anybody been to Alton Towers? I'm sure most people have, yeah? It's in the middle of frigging nowhere, right? So imagine trying to get staff, especially from that area. It's quite rural. So we had to lay on buses back then to enable staff to get to the site. Look at another one. Anyone been to Legoland in Windsor, yeah? It's in a very affluent area. Have you driven around the houses nearby? It's like, wow. Imagine trying to find minimum wage staff to work at Legoland. We ended up having to reach outside of the area and offer transport options. So it's about looking beyond what the obvious is and looking for the solutions. Pay rates can be another one. So for Moto, that's our new one at Rugby. Um, we actually have some Motos that are part of a bigger service station where they're actually in competition. So have you heard of extra services? Within extra, we run some of the outlets. Somebody at Road Chef will run some others. Welcome Break will run some more. We were losing staff to other sites within our own area because it was 50p more an hour. So what we've now gone through, we have now benchmarked each of our sites to make sure that can't happen. So we don't lose a KFC employee to McDonald's that's under Road Chef. So just do that little bit of benchmarking, that little bit of research to understand where you're losing and show what makes you unique. You know, I'm four foot 10. I think people remember me. I kind of like that. So what's your rallying cry? What makes you different? At Merlin, we spent a lot of time developing this. You can't see it very well, but it's love your work, work your magic. By doing a lot of in-depth detail with our employees back then, we established that they loved what they did. They were so proud to say they worked at Legoland or Madame Two Swords, and they loved their job, even if it didn't pay the highest salary. But they also loved their ability to work their magic. In other words, we gave them a lot of freedom to be able to actually do things their way and put their ideas forwards. So that became our rallying cry. We then looked at four key pillars underneath that. I'm sorry you can't see it very well, but I know that these guys will send it afterwards. There were four key pillars that why people came to us. That was fun comes first, which is very true when you work for a theme park. 
Guess what I did today? I remember talking to the accounts team once thinking, I know they work for Merlin, but it can't be that interesting being in accounts at Merlin. They had be been depreciating penguins year on year. And I thought, no, no, it can. It can be unique. Um, the ride of our lives, always quirky, always different working there. Honestly, some of the stuff you had to solve sometimes was just very strange. I, I once found Victoria Beckham's arm in one of the staff rooms at Madame Two Swords. That was definitely uh, bizarre. It had Victoria Beckham written down it and it was just, just, a, just a wax arm. And make magic your way. That was all about that, empowered to, to do things and to put ideas forward. So that employer value, I always struggle with this, employee value proposition is really important. And uh, at Moto, a big part of that is sustainability, electric vehicle charging, things like that that put us at the forefront. It's flexible working. But we also really embrace the fact that our colleagues love working for KFC or Costa, even though ultimately they work for Moto. So we've had to embrace that a little bit. And Merlin had the same. People said they worked for Alton Towers. They forgot they worked for Merlin. So at times we had to embrace that and actually try and build the culture of both of them rather than trying to take away their local community kind of connection. And I would always say the best way, just to ask your people. I've seen a few companies develop an employer brand and an employee value proposition without talking to their people first. And it's easy to make assumptions as to what you think they love about working for you. And actually sometimes it can be quite surprising. So number four is build your reputation. Why would people want to work for you and what is the first thing they think of when they think of working for you? And actually the great thing is earlier, we talked about 77% look at culture, they look at purpose, I totally agree with that. It's really, really true. So things like purpose and culture are really important. I'm really glad we match up because that would have been awkward. Um, <laughs> they also look at inclusivity. Right now, it's becoming a burning topic. They want to see inclusivity. You make sure it's on your recruitment campaigns. It's really easy to stick a picture out there of a white middle-aged man on all your recruitment campaigns and not realize the knock-on impact that's having. Look at your careers campaigns, look at your careers websites, make sure it's inclusive. Look at Glassdoor. I didn't do this on purpose, honestly, all the connections between them all. Um, <laughs> Best Company is a weird one. At Merlin, we relied on Best Companies a lot to really drive recruitment. But I think we came, I think we were something like 25 out of 30 one year, but there were only 33 entries. <laughs> Most people don't know that. So yes, if it works for your audience, brilliant. But I think nowadays people look more at their glass door, their Indeed, than they do some of these more structured formats. This is some, one of the campaigns we did. So this was, um, this was exactly that example I gave. It says, where to-do lists start with counting fish with adverts for Merlin and account accountancy and finance roles. So just show what makes you different, like the headline, the way the images are done can just attract somebody and make it really different. And here's another one, give the gift of terrifically happy tummies. That was an advert for chefs in Legoland. Now, chefs at Legoland make the same meals day in, day out. There's a lack of creativity. So we had to think of why did they love the job? Why did they want to be there? And actually, they loved seeing the smile on those kids' faces. And I have to say, I spent a day working the turnstiles at Legoland. I, I've never felt such a smile on my face. Seeing those kids' faces as they walk in, just as you're swiping their tickets, made me realise why our staff loved going to work every day. So let's nurture our champions. That's my last one. So happiness is key. Happy teams talk. Look at their happiness. Understand what makes them happy and what drives them. And I know people use Maslow's hierarchy of needs a lot, but if you look at that bottom rung being around um, that sense of safety and security, if your staff area doesn't have a clean toilet and they have no lockers to put their stuff in, there's no point shoving in wonderful recognition and bonus schemes because you're not taking care of the basics. Inspire that career journey. Now this is actually from, we um, use a survey company called Workall, so it's work with an L on the end. And they have the six happiness factors, and I love these. So it's reward and recognition, well-being, information sharing, instilling pride, that's a big one I think, empowerment and job satisfaction. And they look at everything around those six factors, and actually it's really hard to find anything that doesn't fit within those six. So look to inspire their career journey and build a pool for the future. We're actually just starting an alumni group on LinkedIn because we know a lot of colleagues actually can leave us but come back again. So how can we keep in touch with them? So using those tools that don't have to be expensive to just keep building that talent pool. We're also launching a new careers website where we're putting in a, a if there's no jobs for you right now, sign up to receive the newsletter where we're going to build stories about our culture. 
So just looking at a different way um, to keep in touch with people. So I hope if, if I've given you two or three nuggets to take away to move you towards being that blue duck, I know I've done my job so today. I, I hope that was valuable for everyone. Uh, uh, some of the HRD and HR surveys that we did, uh, Kira's presentation as, as well as Emma's. Um, and, and I think ultimately it was, how can we be a little bit different? How can we separate ourselves from the crowd? And so I really want to thank everyone for, for uh, their time. And I hope to, to Emma's point that you all receive something of value out of this. Also, I would also like to thank uh, our team, Josh, Debs, and Vic, who put a lot of time, effort, and energy into making this happen. So if we get a quick round of applause. Yeah. The slides will be sent out. Thank you so much for your time and your patience. Again, we hope you receive value out of it. And uh, let's enjoy some more food.